Hello, and uh, <clears throat> welcome to everyone joining the, the webinar today. Uh, my name is Lonnie Northrup. I'm a, a solution architect in care transformation at Intermountain Healthcare. And um, glad to see so many uh, interested in this topic and, you know, just the impact that analytics in general and that machine learning and artificial intelligence is starting to have uh, in healthcare. So just as a reminder to everyone, um, glad to answer any questions. So please uh, submit questions anytime throughout the presentation. Um, and I'll either answer them when you submit them or uh, possibly at the end, depending on how, how time is and things flow. Also, there is a copy of all the slides um, on uh, the link to the webinar. So if you'd like to download those either before or after the webinar, they're, they are there as well. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, for those of you who do not know uh, Intermountain Healthcare, um, we're a large uh, integrated payer provider. So we have both a health plan as well as a large delivery system with uh, over 20 hospitals and close to 200 clinics. And there are over, there are close to uh, 40,000 uh, employees at Intermountain, um, as well as a large affiliated <clears throat> network of, uh, of providers as well. So we're certainly not the largest healthcare system in the country, but we are one of the substantially sized healthcare systems and also have a strong heritage of being recognized as a leader in delivery of innovative and cost-effective healthcare and are known as a leader as well in the use of data and analytics in delivering better healthcare, which I'll talk about in a moment. So our mission is helping people live the healthiest lives possible. Um, that isn't helping people in Utah to live the healthiest lives possible, but literally helping as many people as we can to live the healthiest lives possible. The original mission of our organization was to become a model healthcare system so that we would hopefully do things that were innovative and effective that could then be shared broadly um, across healthcare in the United States and around the world. And we continue to have that mission. Um, we have <clears throat> um, a lot of education that we do uh, with other healthcare systems, but as a uh, an integrated payer provider um, and as a as a nonprofit health system, we're in a position to you know do things like the web webinar that we have now to hopefully share these things and also to learn from others. So, wish this was more interactive, so there was more of that learning aspect for us. So at this point, this presentation is going to be a little bit more talking about what we've done as well as what we're aware of what our peers are doing that we haven't done yet that we're hoping to be able to achieve in the future. So to start with, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on data and analytics at Intermountain. Um, <clears throat> we, we are primarily focused on using data and analytics to drive better healthcare outcomes. So here is just a sampling of some areas where we have made some um, notable achievements as well as <clears throat> um, just a, a number of areas so you can see the breadth of where data and analytics impacts uh, the work and the care that we deliver at Intermountain Healthcare. So um, in a lot of areas, our mortality rates and performance measures are, you know, in the top half of the national average, but um, <clears throat> in many cases in the top uh, 5 and 10 percent of natural, national averages. So we have a very uh, strong cardiovascular uh, practice um, and do extremely well with heart failure mortality rates and heart failure readmission rates, et cetera, uh, sepsis mortality rates, and we have a, 
um, a strong, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our sepsis work. Um, so I won't read through everything on the slides. Um, a lot of the information on the slides, uh, you know, by making it available later, you can hopefully pick up on that rather than me uh, touching on everything that's on the slides. I tried to provide more information than we could cover in a presentation, but make it possible for you to go back and look at those in more detail as well. So <clears throat> a lot of you have probably seen various versions of an analytic maturity matrix, um, but analytics is a, is a continuum that starts with information that ultimately results in actions being taken and hopefully improved <clears throat> clinical or business outcomes being achieved. So we source data from over 200 different sources, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. The data gets prepared, and then we go through a variety of uh, reporting and analytics uh, tasks. So, so descriptive analytics describing what happened. So how many patients are we seeing? How many patients were readmitted? How many um, <clears throat> patients received uh, or had an infection? And um, what's the turnaround time in our emergency department? And all of those types of things. So in our descriptive analytics, we have over <clears throat> 4,000 Cognos reports as well is over 2,700 Tableau dashboards. And those reports and dashboards literally cover every aspect of what we do from clinical to uh, insurance um, to supply chain, HR, um, literally every aspect of our business is covered by the data and analytics reports and dashboards that we produce. Um, along in those same dashboards, you can do some analysis about why some of these things are happening, trending, um, <clears throat> looking at statistical analysis to see opportunities for making improvements. The, the next level of uh, analytics maturity is actually doing predictive analysis. So what is anticipated and uh, you know, what bad events do we see coming um, and what's the likelihood of those occurring, and what can we do to intervene to prevent those future adverse events uh, from happening. So we have a number of predictive algorithms that we've developed in addition to using industry standard types of predictive algorithms that help us to avoid <clears throat> um, bad future outcomes by intervening early. And then the next level of maturity um, would be prescriptive analytics. So for us, the, the most significant form of prescriptive analytics are our care <clears throat> process models. So with our care process models, we <clears throat> um, have proven evidence-based practices that we've developed over a period of decades um, for delivering better <clears throat> outcomes. So that can be, you know, so we have care process, mo about 80 um, care process models covering everything from behavioral health, cardiovascular, um, imaging, musculoskeletal, oncology, um, every aspect of what we do in providing clinical care um, are covered by our care process models. And there's a little more detail on our care process models on slide 34. I'm not going to jump to it at this time. Um, so <clears throat> that kind of moves us up a, a pretty significant um, curve of where data and analytics and the maturity that we've achieved at Intermountain. So we have been doing forms of analytics for um, many, many decades. Our first electronic medical records started in 1972, and <clears throat> we've had a, an enterprise data warehouse um, for nearly 20 years. So um, we have a lot of experience doing this, but now we're moving to a new level of analytic maturity um, called personalized analytics. So let me explain that a little bit. So 
um, one of our uh, clinical services in oncology is for precision medicine. So we need, we use genomic data um, in order to identify um, treatment options for patients. And slide 32 of the deck gives some uh, explanation of what we're doing in our precision medicine group. But <clears throat> many years ago, uh, a drug was developed uh, for treating early detection of breast cancer called tamoxifen. And all through the clinical trials and the development of the drug, it was discovered that the drug was effective in sending breast cancer into remission for about 80% of the patients who received the treatment. Um, subsequent to that, uh, as more work was done in genomic research, and this is kind of a very unique case, but it was found that there was one genetic marker that was tied to whether or not this drug tamoxifen would be successful in treating <clears throat> early detection of breast cancer. And um, interestingly, it worked almost every time. So if the person had the marker, then they would respond to tamoxifen as an intervention. If they didn't have the marker, then they wouldn't respond to tamoxifen as a treatment. So when we um, diagnose someone with breast cancer, we always run this genomic test in order to determine whether or not they'll be a candidate for tamoxifen as an intervention. But equally as important, if they're not a candidate, then we don't prescribe it to them and we look for other treatment options, um, saving both cost as well as adverse effects of administering a drug that will have side effects but won't be effective in treating uh, the condition. So what we're going to talk about today is this personalized analytics that allow us to get down to providing intervention recommendations <clears throat> at an individual level and then intervening and helping people to manage their treatment and intervention recommendations at a personal level as well. And this is something that is facilitated through machine learning and all artificial intelligence and advanced analytics capabilities. Um, <clears throat> and we will talk about that in more detail as we go through. But it's important to understand that there's a combination. So we hear the phrase artificial intelligence, and we prefer using the phrase augmented intelligence or assisted intelligence because healthcare is not going to be like a self-driving car. You need to have human <clears throat> oversight and clinically certified uh, clinicians taking these recommendations and then ob observing and interpreting whether or not they're actually valid and safe uh, for the patients that are receiving treatments. So we see that this use of artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence will have a, a very significant impact on improving healthcare outcomes. And as we'll discuss, that is already happening. So on slide nine, there's just a little bit of a description about what I just discussed in terms of the progression from descriptive to personalized analytics, but also referencing some of the tools and methods kind of culminating in the most uh, significant case around machine learning <clears throat> and this augmented intelligence. So in order to get to the point where you have the data <clears throat> uh, and the insights in order to achieve this high level of um, analytic insight and actions, um, it takes a fair amount of work with data and a platform and, and a team of people to make that happen. So at Intermountain, this is how we are organized around our data and analytics functions. So we have a data warehouse, we have governance to help with data quality and master data management, um, a semantics team that <clears throat> helps with the coding of the data so that we can use it consistently, um, another broader team of analysts, so we have um, a core team of around 100 people, and then 
spread throughout the company or analysts, a couple hundred analysts that you know are tied to specific clinical or business areas. Um, <clears throat> and then we have business intelligence and reporting group. And then we're also constantly looking at new opportunities for improving uh, data and analytics. And that's primarily my function is finding, piloting, and implementing new data and analytics solutions leading to better uh, healthcare outcomes and, and reduce costs. So I, I won't go into detail on these slides, but we have a very sophisticated platform as well as architecture behind our data and analytics from when we source the data from over 200 systems into our data warehouse. Um, we have a data lake as well as a data warehouse. Um, and then all of the functions to manage, map, cleanse, organize, and then report on that data, as well as perform advanced analytics uh, using that data. Um, <clears throat> and these two slides, 12 and 13, show a little bit about our architecture. And just to give you um, a sense on slide 14, just um, a, a subset, but a high-level description of some of the areas that we um, receive and have data in our, in our enterprise data warehouse. So now I want to jump forward to you know, this topic of uh, analytics-driven personalized healthcare. So for us, there are really three components to this. Um, the first is being able to predict at an individual level how much each person will spend on healthcare. Um, a lot of uh, algorithms out there are focused on risk stratification, so it can put people in rank order as who's at higher or lower risk of, of future um, adverse outcomes. But we actually have developed an algorithm that will allow us to predict with high accuracy how much money each individual person is going to spend on healthcare uh, in the next 12 months. So knowing, and so that creates as well a rank order list, but based on something a little more precise of actual dollars to be spent. The second part of this uh, personalized, analytics driven personalized healthcare is the ability to actually produce for each individual person a statistically ranked list of the next best thing they can do for their health. And I'll talk about that you know, in the next few slides. And then finally, once we've identified this list, um, that will be of no value unless the patient actually does these better things to improve their health care. And so the, the third piece of this is also a machine learning and AI-driven approach to personalize connecting the patient to their care team 24 hours a day to help them do these better um, health behaviors. So we have, um, over the last five years, evaluated um, somewhere between three and 400 vendors of data and analytics for, for health care. And of <clears throat> those solutions, we have um, piloted about 3% of the solutions, and then we have pur purchased just 1% of the things that we have looked at. So two of the things we're going to talk about today in the center section, the second and third step of this analytics-driven personalized healthcare, the middle piece is from a company called Javion, and the third piece from a company called CareCentra. And for us, these fall into a 1% of things that we have looked at that actually produce results for other healthcare systems that are better than the results that we have been uh, generating at, at Intermountain. So first to this next best action intervention uh, recommendation list. So Javion is probably the most sophisticated machine learning and artificial intelligence platform that we have seen in healthcare. Um, it, unlike other tools where you start with the data that you give it, uh, Javion has been trained over 10 years, over tens of millions of patient lives. 
and they've incorporated data from a wide variety of data sources. So they've incorporated clinical claims data, um, actual clinical data, um, social data, so consumer spending habits, internet behaviors, uh, technology adoption, uh, census data, uh, socioeconomic data, you know, what zip code does someone live in, what's their level of education, um, <clears throat> et cetera. Uh, clinical research, so uh, published findings from New England Journal of Medicine, uh, JAMA, and others that have been clinically curated and incorporated into the supervised learning portion of the platform, um, <clears throat> but also Medicare and other forms of commercially available data um, that inform the way millions of people uh, are prescribed and respond to treatments in managing their health. Then from all of this data, the, the math, I won't go into the math behind this uh, in this short presentation, but the primary math behind the JVM platform is eigen similarity mapping. So this is the same primary math that's in the Google PageRank algorithm. And what it does is it can look across um, tens of thousands and even <clears throat> millions of dimensions of data and look at how things are similar across an N dimension of space. So if you think of a sheet of paper as two-dimensional and you know things that you interact with, like a computer or a glass or something, is a three-dimensional, um, Javion an analyzes how things are um, similar to one another across N dimensions. So they have developed over 153,000 algorithms of patient similarity. And by in putting in a relatively small amount of data, so the data <clears throat> that we feed it is uh, claims data, ADT data, labs data, and meds data, we can match an individual person um, to a subset of these 153,000 algorithms which then allows us to do three really important things. Um, we can identify their risk um, of having uh, a bad future health event. We can identify, so this is a little different than some <clears throat> machine learning that tends to be more black box. We can actually identify what are the drivers um, of risk that are going to lead to those bad future outcomes. And then most significantly, and we have not been able to find another platform that does this thing, is to provide patient-level intervention recommendations. And those recommendations are both clinical as well as social economic. So it's a, <clears throat> a very big um, step to move from population-based, probability-based recommendations, risk scoring-based observations to actual individual intervention uh, recommendations. So <clears throat> then with those recommendations, Javion has had success um, in uh, over close to three dozen healthcare systems in over 60 use cases. So here, are just a few examples of those. Um, <clears throat> but achieving very significant reductions in clinical utilization, reductions in readmissions, um, improvements in clinical outcomes. And so this is part of what we are moving toward. Um, we piloted Javion using an avoidable admissions use case for a population of about 100,000 of our um, at-risk contracts. So where we're taking on um, <clears throat> helping uh, health plan members at risk for a per member per month charge, we're using, we use Javion to see where there would be avoidable admissions. So we loaded three years of data in, did a retrospective analysis, um, and Javion produced not only an extremely high accuracy in predicting year over year who was going to uh, experience these avoidable admissions, but 
even more importantly, identifying at an individual level what each person could do to avoid those future <clears throat> adverse events from occurring. Um, so they have uh, achieved you know, savings of tens of millions of dollars. Oh, let me, before I do that, let me spend a minute on, on these individual intervention recommendations. So <clears throat> what TVM produces is um, a statistically ranked list of the diagnosis codes that are, are the primary drivers of risk for these future adverse events. Then they also identify um, the statistically driving social economic factors <clears throat> that would lead to a bad future outcome. Um, then with, with the engine, then they can provide an, both a clinical list of interventions that will prevent these future adverse events, as well as the social economic list of things interventions that can be done to avoid these future bad outcomes, but they can also predict the propensity of each person to engage in those intervention recommendations that are being provided. So the three columns here are just illustrative examples from a few of the patients in the <clears throat> pilot that we did with Javion around avoidable admissions. So, so Javion has achieved uh, amazing you know, cost reductions in, in many of their customers, literally millions to tens of millions of dollars in savings um, in readmissions and penalties and, and other things. And so we are just starting to broadly deploy uh, Javion. So we're hoping to actually produce the results that were identified in our retrospective study around avoidable admissions, but we are also starting work <clears throat> with them around avoidable ED visits, all-cause readmission, uh, COPD, opioid abuse, preterm births, um, uh, forget all of them. But So we're up to somewhere between 10 to 12 <clears throat> that we're pursuing. And um, up until now, Javion has not incorporated um, genomic data into their platform. So we are starting to work with them along with a couple of other um, very recognizable uh, companies, uh, healthcare providers that are using Javion and also looking to incorporate genomic data to improve both the accuracy of the predictions as well as the specificity of the intervention recommendations. So currently at Intermountain, our genomic work is <clears throat> primarily um, around precision medicine and oncology, um, and that's expanding into other uh, adjacent areas, but we also do quite a bit with um, pharmacogenomics, um, so doing testing to help in precisely administering <clears throat> um, antidepressants and blood thinners and other interventions, um, as well as assessing where there's personal risk for drug-drug interactions, and we can determine how rapidly people will assimilate drugs that they take based on <clears throat> their genomic profile. So we're looking to merge that. We have a very large biorepository with um, samples from over 5 million patients. So we're doing retrospective analysis of uh, cancerous tumor um, <clears throat> samples. So we recently just did sequencing on every um, sample that we had for pancreatic cancer uh, <clears throat> uh, patients. And um, so we're, we're moving forward into adding not only um, the genomic data to this work with Javion, but also more device data. So information coming off of Fitbit, so and Apple Watches and glucose monitors and We'll see about the EKG thing on the Apple, um, <clears throat> the new Apple Watch, et cetera. Um, so a lot of, and then another really significant thing, which we'll talk about now as we move into the intervention of how do you get these people to follow these intervention recommendations is the patient reported data, um, which has been largely like socioeconomic data, 
patient reported data has been largely absent from a lot of the analysis and intervention work that's been done in recent years. So that improving as well. So now I'm going to shift gears into the third <clears throat> pillar of this analytics-driven personalized healthcare, which is connecting the patient to their care team uh, 24 hours a day. So <clears throat> what this looks like, there's a we have looked at over a dozen um, providers of this type of capability that have had extremely um, successful, unprecedented results in helping people to improve their health, uh, reduce. So the, the things we see here, patient satisfaction of 85 to 100%, patient adherence rates higher than 70%, reductions in inpatient visits of, uh, this one's anecdotal, but close to 90%, um, reduction in hospital readmissions of 70% or more, and <clears throat> increasing care management capacity. So instead of wasting lots of time dialing the phone um, and reaching out to these uh, people, if they prefer a text message, then you can get a quick response and it saves everyone time and money. Um, multiply that times a number of other preferred communication mechanism type of interactions, and you achieve dramatically improved care management capacity while at the same time dramatically improving the clinical outcomes. Um, and so some of the things on slides um, 38 through 45, um, and I'll come back to this as well, but I've given very specific examples from about um, <clears throat> more than half a dozen of these companies that are achieving the outcomes referenced in this summary uh, slide here. So the way, <clears throat> before I move to that, let me just comment that the, the way that these improved interactions are happening is that the patient is connected to the care team through um, a portal that man the care management dashboard that manages the population, but then the patient chooses how they want to interact with their care team. And that portal also, and some apps and other things, can connect the care team, including family members, so that everyone that's involved in delivering care and helping this person to adhere to these better um, health behaviors um, <clears throat> has access to this information and can see how the person's doing and it is in a position uh, to help them. Um, so the platform that we're using uh, from CareCentra goes beyond a step beyond what we've seen from any other of these platforms. So what CareCentra does using this machine, machine learning and AI-based approach is they create a motivational behavioral profile um, <clears throat> for each person. And <clears throat> That is based on physical things the person's capable of, what their diet is, stress, how well they understand uh, health information, what their environment is, how are they socially isolated or are they part of a, you know, a, a, a group of people. And so it, it tracks all of these things and develops as the patient uses it, this motivational behavioral profile and so now, if from Javion we were to provide a list of 17 things to do, the patient wouldn't be able to do all, no patient is going to be able to do everything. Um, so what we do instead is work with the patient, and this is a critical success factor, to let them choose the things that they're willing and able to do so that we get them on a trajectory towards improved health. And <clears throat> Care Centra is smart enough to not prompt them to do something that they're not willing and able to do. And so as people receive prompts, so the, the science behind Care Centra is based on nudge theory. And nudge science, the, kind of the leader of the nudge science move, movement, Richard Thaler, um, was awarded a, a Nobel Prize last year uh, for his work in nudge theory. So the, the success of nudge theory is extremely high, but it basically is just helping us to do the things we want to do 
but sometimes you know we just forget about specific behaviors or we're maybe lacking motiva motivation if we can be reminded about things in an appropriate way then we're much more successful at achieving better outcomes so care center manages this curve and it only motive it only prompts people for the things that they're willing and able to do so if the number one thing on the list of here's what you should do was quitting smoking and the patient is not at a not willing or able to quit smoking then we don't waste everybody's time by just pummeling them with information about smoking cessation programs and why smoking is bad for your health and and what ends up happening in those instances is we actually alienate um, patients from doing the other things that they are willing and able to do. The, this becomes a distraction for them. So being able to work closely with patients. So the, one of the best uh, use cases that we've had so far with this um, is around medication adherence for complex cardiovascular patients. So we're in... Um, <clears throat> nearing the end of the third year of a clinical trial. Um, so it's cardiovascular patients that, that are complex that have two or more comorbidities in addition to their heart disease. And um, we haven't published the results yet, so I won't use specific numbers, but I'll just say that we are seeing a dramatic improvement in medication adherence and an even more compelling reduction um, in mortality in the intervention groups that are using uh, this solution. But one thing I can share is how well the solution is being used. So, so this study um, was touching between 250 to 300 people, and <clears throat> um, we've only had a 7% a fallout over the three years in people using the platform. And at the year and a half mark, the net promoter score from those using the platform, so for those familiar with net promoter scores, typically 30 is about an average net promoter score and 70 is considered a really good net promoter score. The net promoter score for the participants in this trial at the 18 month mark was literally 100%. So there are some unprecedented results that are being achieved <clears throat> using this technology and this platform and this approach. And now we're expanding that work into uh, preterm births, into type 1 diabetes, and preparing to hopefully couple it with everything we're doing with Javion. Uh, COPD is one of the other next ones that we have um, coming up. So. Um, on this next slide, 24, I'm just showing what these nudges look like. In this case, um, a, a sampling from what we're doing in our preterm birth work. So, so when we identify <clears throat> that an expectant mother is at risk of a preterm birth, then we have significant intervention protocols. And one of the protocols is actually this increased interaction uh, with the patient. So in addition to you know taking aspirin every day, taking progesterone regularly, um, running a symptoms checker so they can see if their uh, symptoms are progressing or becoming uh, higher risk. Um, <clears throat> so the system just manages that in conjunction with the care team. And this is just to illustrate what those nudges and prompts uh, might look like in this case for preterm birth. So as we have looked at, you know, hundreds of things, and I, I mentioned, <clears throat> you know, the, and I'd highly recommend you look at some of the results on slides 38 to 45 from other solutions in this um, patient engagement space or personalized health engagement space. It connects the patient to the care team 24 hours a day. The care team is everyone involved in the care, including the family members. Um, the patient selects the goals and the intervention to pursue rather than having those things dictated by the care team. The patient selects how they want to communicate. So they can do texting, they can do phone calls, they can have video visits, 
They can have home visits. They can use Alexa on their kitchen table. They decide, and this is critically important, they decide how they want to receive these interventions. So it's healthcare when, where, and how they want to receive it rather than how the healthcare system is dictating it to them. Um, it also allows the care team to monitor feedback or lack of feedback. So this is where these efficiencies are gained because the patient is interacting with the system and a lot of that interaction is automated <clears throat> from the system side. They see, are they recording whether or not they took their medications? Are they recording other, you know, interventions? So are they walking? Are they getting sufficient sleep? Or everything that that gets prescribed to them as interventions that will help them get better, it monitors with no intervention <clears throat> from the care team but makes it extremely easy for the patient. So most of these interactions for these patients are three to five seconds. And what we found that is if you can get a patient responding, you know, interacting with an app um, three to five times a day, then they will be very engaged in their healthcare and they will continue to progress and their health will improve and their ability to do more difficult interventions will increase as well. So we also make it possible for the patients to connect devices. So if they wanna connect their Fitbit or they wanna connect their Apple Watch or glucose monitor or wireless scale or whatever, they can connect it to this platform and it'll support that. We have seen um, a real disproportionate amount of focus on the use of devices um, in the work that we've done and the work we've observed from our peers. And what we have found is these devices can be extremely helpful, but they're only helpful for the patients that want to use them. Um, when you're trying to force people to use things and monitor and things, they, they push back on it or they'll just revolt against it and not use it at all. So the, the, key message here is patient choice. And, and when the platform is personalized and it doesn't ask the patient really dumb things. So um, if we, you know, I actually was using one of these platforms for a weight loss program and they had a, a wireless scale and I had kind of plateaued on my weight and <clears throat> the system was was sending me an email every single day saying, Mr. Northrup, if you didn't step on the scale, it's found that if you track your weight, blah, blah, blah. And they found, I don't know, 32 different ways to say that thing. But instead of actually having a coach reach out to me and say, hey, what's going on? We noticed that you're not stepping on the scale. Um, I just got these irritating questions literally for almost three months. And then I just quit using the platform. So it's really, really important that people get nudges and reminders that they think are helpful to them. And this is just another form of alert fatigue that we move from a clinical setting to a personal setting. If we barrage people with requests that they're not finding benefits from, then they're not going to continue uh, to use and, and follow those things. So, um, so just in summary, then this analytics-driven personalized healthcare starts with a personalized prediction of cost, advances to a personalized list of the next best thing that person can do to improve their health, and then is capped with this ability to connect a person to their care team 24 hours a day in a very personalized way that learns and knows the person so they can prompt them in ways that are helpful to them that will encourage their behavior change and encourage their adherence to better healthcare practices rather than being pushed away from it. So I'm going to just quickly show you what I've got here for background and I'll come back to the questions. So in the backup slides, there's some slides talking about other things that are using machine learning in healthcare that are actually producing results. Um, it 
has some examples of what we're doing at Intermountain. So our work around our precision medicine, um, <clears throat> we also use machine learning and artificial intelligence in our security monitoring and cybersecurity. Um, the care process models that I described, we have another platform from a company called IASD that we use for optimizing our care process models. Um, <clears throat> we're working with a company called Zebra Medical uh, to do machine learning over the top of diagnostic imaging. So we have a, a an imaging library that has over 3 billion uh, imaging studies, and we're using that to um, detect disease states in, in medical imaging. Um, <clears throat> We do a lot with natural language processing as well, so using unstructured data to help drive insights. And I'm just, as you can tell, this would take a long time to delve into, into each of these topics, but I'm providing these as backups so that you can see that <clears throat> contrary to some of the things that are being said in the industry right now, there are a small number of things that are actually generating very substantial uh, impacts in improvements in clinical care using machine learning and artificial intelligence. So here's the sequence of eight slides that I mentioned around personal health engagement. Um, I've referenced the, the vendors of the products, but if anyone is interested, I could connect you to the actual healthcare systems where these results were achieved. So these are, are not just a, an advertisement from um, <clears throat> a vendor, but these are things that we've validated by actually talking to the healthcare systems that are using these tools and the results that they're achieving. So that goes in slides, um, down through slide 46. Um, so now um, <clears throat> looks like we have a few questions that have come in, but I would really, you know, like to encourage more questions. Um, I think we should have time to cover the ones that have come in so far, but um, would like to cover more as well. So the first question is, how did you get approvals to use full PHI data in large volumes in a cloud environment? So I think I alluded to this, maybe I didn't say it explicitly, but with Javion, it is a, <clears throat> a cloud-based platform as is CareCentra. And it took us, um, well, it took us years if we go back to the first pilots that we did. I mean, the very first pilot that we did trying to use <clears throat> this PHI data in the machine learning, we literally loaded the data, the patient data, on a hard drive, an encrypted hard drive, and we did all of the, the pilot work in our data center, and the vendor brought in a computer and then during the testing, we connected the hard drive to the computer. The computer and the hard drive stayed in the data center while we were doing the testing. And then we would check it into a vault every night. We had it connected to no, no internet connections so that no data could be moved. And this is about five years ago. So it reflects kind of the progression that's been made with confidence around security. So from that to now most recently, <clears throat> um, We've uploaded um, all three years of data from our members and our patients to inform these clinical improvements. And so we had to go through legal, security, compliance, um, a, a bunch of things to get to, to where we're at. So the, the Javion platform is running um, <clears throat> on Azure, uh, was previously running on AWS. So so all the BAAs and everything involved in that, we've had to go through. And because we have such advanced um, <clears throat> security, we have you know, great assurance that we will never experience a data breach. Um, but we have a bunch of fail safes in place around that as well. So, <clears throat> so that was a big deal to get to that point, And it's been a, an evolution over the last several years. Okay, the next question is, uh, please describe your experience with achieving regulatory approvals for machine learning AI products and services. Specific machine learning AI techniques that <clears throat> evolve 
cannot be reliably tested for future performance. Are there specific FDA guidelines for approvals of machine learning AI products related to diagnosis and intervention? Okay, so there's quite a bit there, but all on the same theme from a regulatory perspective, how is this achieved? So currently, the, the majority of the work that we're doing with machine learning and AI in this case is for clinical improvement. Okay, and so that changes. So when we identify that we're doing, for instance, uh, a program <clears throat> to reduce opioid abuse, then the things that we are doing are helping. So, so in that case, we don't necessarily have to go through a research approach, which often in research, in addition to going through an IRB or um, an internal review board, um, <clears throat> you may actually have to de-identify the data, particularly if the data is being shared outside of the organization. But when it's being used for research purposes, most of the time you have to de-identify the data. So one of the keys is that we're using it for <clears throat> Um, clinical improvement. The other thing is we are not providing recommendations to patients. The, the intervention recommendations go to the, the care provider, and they have to use their professional judgment as to whether or not this information gets recommended <clears throat> um, to the patient. And this keeps us from getting into the realm of these intervention recommendations becoming a medical device, which would then require FDA device approval. Um, we are hearing that the FDA and others are, are, are pushing down further into how um, these machine learning and, and AI algorithms are being used. So we're compliant with every current regulation that's out there and then beyond because we we go beyond um, what's required to provide additional security um, to the work that we do. But so this is an evolving state. Um, some machine learning and AI is black box. And so another key consideration is um, can you do statistical cross-validation to provide additional evidence of the efficacy and the accuracy of the information coming out of the AI. So this is a really complex question that's being asked and has been you know, top of mind and center of a lot of the work that we've done getting to the point we're at, but we're seeing that this is continuing to evolve and the FDA and other regulatory organizations are getting more and more concerned as they should be about these AI driven things and how they are being used. You know, so so self driving car is, you know, the example that comes up most frequently, but you have to consider the safety and other things. So in healthcare, we believe there will always be um a human in the loop, whether they're just validating the results that are or the recommendations that are coming through. But anyway, hopefully that helps, and, and again, if, you, if anyone has questions, the first slide um, has my contact information, and I'd be more than happy to um, have people give me a call, and the navigation on this thing only lets you go a slide at a time, so I'm gonna cycle back through those. Um, but I'd be glad to respond in more detail if I haven't sufficiently answered any of these questions. So uh, another question, could you say more about how people are connected continuously to their care team? Can they have a conversation with their physician and how is that done? Okay, great. And I apologize if I didn't go into enough detail. So, so they choose how they want to interact. So, and they can choose preferences. So for instance, in our clinical trial around medication adherence, 64% uh, of the people chose to interact using texting. Um, as their first choice, okay, because you have, you know, if, you, if that doesn't work, then you can go second, third, whatever. So <clears throat> if the patient requests, they can actually, so we are currently in the 
programs that we're doing, we connect people to um, a disease-specific task force that's working on these things. Um, so they can, and, and some of those are staffed 24 hours a day. So they can get to someone close to, that's part of their care team. Um, but as we scale this, we're connecting it to our, um, we will be connecting it to our answers hotline, so our ask a nurse hotline, as well as we have something called Connect Care, which is 24 hour a day video visit capability. Um, <clears throat> or if it was uh, an intervention emergency, we may send out a home nurse or we um, may recommend that they come into the clinic or uh, into <clears throat> into emergency department. So, so the continuous connection is a communication mechanism that has uh, an escalation protocol. And but they can just select video visit and be right into a video visit. Now, whether or not they will get immediately to their doctor. Um, in most cases, that, that will probably be a no. Um, however, when it goes to a care manager or a coach, um, there, you know, internally we have other escalation protocols where they can potentially get directly to the doctor, to their cell phone, et cetera. So it'll just depend on the urgency of the situation. But, but the 24-hour thing is that they have communication that's being sent and received and monitored 24 hours a day. And so if there is an emergency, it will go into the flow that escalates that <clears throat> in order to help them get the help that they need uh, in a timely way. Okay, so there's a couple more questions. I may not be able to get to all of them. So just a reminder, um, if you, if we don't get to your question, because we've only got a few minutes left, please email me at the email address on this slide, and I'll be glad to to answer your question. So, so one of the, I'll just do one of the two, and the other one I'll have to do uh, by email. So, <clears throat> the one question is, how do you get clinical teams to accept and implement the recommendations being generated by machine learning and AI? Um, Great question. So some of the teams are more receptive than others. It depends on, you know, what kind of information they're getting now and is this information we're providing them significantly better and do they trust it? So generally the trust factor is coming from um, what we've seen other health systems achieved coupled with our retrospective analysis that allows us to give it a statistical confidence factor. Um, <clears throat> but we have, and so some, for some doctors that's sufficient. We have other doctors, you know, particularly those involved in academic research and other research work where they want to see a peer-reviewed and published study. And we do have peer-reviewed and published studies for, you know, handfuls of these things, but not for every one of them. And so that really is just a, um, a, a doctor by doctor, you know, care manager by care manager type thing to where they get comfortable. But again, we're only providing them recommendations. Then it's up to them to decide whether or not they agree with those recommendations to the point that they will use them in their interaction with their patients. And I'll, I'll try and cram this other one in. With so many options and vendors in this space, how do you decide where to spend your limited time for investigating new tools and capabilities? Okay, so for us, the number one factor is <clears throat> has the thing from this new vendor produced a result at another healthcare system that is better than what we're achieving at Intermountain? And we don't find a lot that fall into that category, and that's what kind of leads us to that 1% thing. So if, if they can't demonstrate that they've done that, and not only do we just take their word for it, we're part of a, of a group called the Healthcare Data and Analytics Association, where we collaborate with all the other leading healthcare systems across the country. And so we will just ask them where they've done it, 
and then we will call our peers and validate if the claims that they're giving us are true or not. So that's one advantage we have, and, and any healthcare system can join the Healthcare Data and Analytics Association. Um, vendors can't join it, but that has been a, a really key uh, for us to be able to make good use of our time, not chasing after things that don't have proven results. And we, from that, from the clinical side, we focused on things that are proven to work rather than making the focus of our efforts novel discovery. Um, although we do work around novel discovery as well. So I appreciate um, everyone's time in listening to this. And again, you can go back and listen to it again. You can download the slides and feel free to contact me as well. And thank you very much and appreciate everyone's participation. Goodbye.